All right, that's better. Okay, so numbers and narratives using project outcome to assess teaching effectiveness in one shots, courses, and programs. Um, I'm Erin Wasworth Anderson, and I'm an instructional designer at the Center for Innovative Design and Instruction at Utah State University. That's a mouthful. And we are so excited to have Scott Lanning, Rosie Lindquist, and Chris Youngkin from uh, Southern Utah University. And I'll let them introduce themselves and get going. Thank you very much. And I shall start, of course, by attempting to share my screen and hit the present button. So we are going to talk about numbers and narratives today, like you heard. And as you also heard, we are indeed from Southern Utah University. I'm Scott Lanning, I'm the assessment librarian. I'm Rosie Lillenquist. I'm the scholarly communications librarian. And uh, I'm Chris Youngkin, and I'm the I'm an instruction librarian. So at SUU, librarians are in a pretty unique position. We are both librarians and faculty. So that means as librarians, we teach a lot of one-shot trainings. We go into a class for 45 minutes once a semester and show them how to use a database. But as faculty members, we also teach credit bearing courses and are subject to our, our very new and very different uh, promotion and tenure policy, which requires evidence of teaching and learning from us when we write up our stuff. So um, we found a project outcome and we're gonna talk a little bit about what it is and how it's used because it, it has some really great uses for us. Um, project outcome is a, a collection of surveys uh, designed to assess library programs and services. There are seven different surveys as part of the uh, project outcome suite of surveys, and each survey has an immediate survey and a follow-up survey. And the one we're going to focus on, the one we use the most, is the immediate instruction survey, which gives us feedback on our teaching. Um, all the surveys have a very standard uh, layout. They all feature six standard questions and the option to add more. Four of those questions are Likert scale questions. And these are the questions from the instruction survey. I learned something new that will help me succeed in my classes. I feel more confident about completing my assignment. I intend to apply what I just learned. I am more aware of the library's resources and services. And then the, the, the two open-ended questions that are part of every survey are, uh, what did you like most about this session? And what else could the library do to help you succeed in your classes? And then, like I said, you can add uh, up to three more open-ended questions. And we've kind of settled on two that we like a lot. And they are, please share one thing you learned today. And please share one thing you are still confused about. And since everyone here is a teacher, you might recognize that these are really, really standard exit ticket style questions. So project outcome requires a little bit of work. It's really, they've really done a really um, great job of making it easy to use. You basically sign up for an account online and then you say, I wanna generate an immediate uh, instruction um, survey and you walk through the process and you add questions if you want to add additional questions and then it gives you um, the pdf and the url for your survey uh, the one thing that we really have to watch out for is naming conventions there's no way to tag your surveys for easy follow-up and, and manipulation of, of, of all the data basically that you're collecting so we had to come up with a naming convention to help us um, have a way to look back at all of these surveys that we're doing and divide them either out by you know departments or course level or the librarian or the instructor we did it for and and all that kind of wonderful stuff so we have to think carefully about how you're going to name your surveys so you can use them in in different ways to evaluate your teaching and your programs First way to administer um, a project outcome survey is to give a paper-based survey in class. So after you, you give your little spiel about how to search a database, you can pass out the survey and students can fill it out and turn it in when they're done. Um, the big drawback to this is then you have to manually enter all of that data that you collected into the project outcome website. 
um, so it can collect and organize your data. The good part about this though, is that um, you get really high return rates when you do a paper-based survey in class and co collect those surveys. Um, and, and, and it doesn't take long to do, you just really need five minutes at the end of class. So it works out really well. You can do the web-based survey. And the great thing about giving students the URL is their responses are automatically compi compiled, which is really, really great. But again, the disadvantage here is if, if you have them do it outside of class, your return rate is really going to suffer. Okay, and, and so even if you're going to do the web-based survey, it might be a great idea to set aside those five or 10 minutes at the end of your session and say, okay, now take out your phone, take out your laptop and, and fill out this survey and give them the URL. So they'll, they'll do the survey right there so you can get a higher response rate. So what sort of results do we get from project outcome? The Likert scale questions give us wonderful, beautiful numbers and results and charts and graphs to look at. Um, I, I like how they've divided up the information here. So the, the top uh, couple of lines show us the how many answers, uh, the percent of answers that fell into the four or five category on the Likert scale question. So 100% of student, students learn something new that will help, help them succeed in the class. And then you can see when you go down into the middle section that 30% of the answers were four and 70% and of the answers were five on the Likert scale question that corresponds to that. I really like how they have it divided up this way. And then the bottom section is also really very helpful and useful. So on the left-hand side, you've got your average score for that session that you taught. So that's your feedback score for, for this session. And then that's compared directly to on the other side, your library average. So that the first column on just to the right of that is your library average um, score for all of the assessments you've given. And then your Carnegie class average followed by a national average. And then the total is international, but there aren't that many international schools participating. So sometimes you won't see much of a difference. Okay, let me just check chat real quick. Thank you. Okay, we'll have to go that way. So we've used lots of evaluations at Southern Utah University and for student feedback and uh, student evaluations of teaching. How does project outcome compare to them? Well, our, our old evaluations were generally not terribly well thought, thought of. Question nine is the first evaluation I encountered here. It was a homegrown um, student evaluation. And for PNT purposes, it all boiled down to question nine, which was, what do you think of your teacher? And that was the only thing that was used to evaluate your teaching effectiveness from students was question nine. Um, so rightfully, faculty were not very happy about that. We switched to IDEA um, a few years back. And the problem we had with IDEA uh, was it was very long and students hated to take it. Uh, it could be 42 questions or more. And we got a, just a horrible, horrible return rate uh, from IDEA. And then even the data we got was complicated and difficult to use and, and didn't give us a lot of, of good feedback. So just a couple of years ago, we switched to Evaluation Kit, which is a platform. It's basically a, a survey platform. And we developed, again, our own questions uh, to use in Evaluation Kit. And these questions focus on the use of high impact practices in classes. Some of them can be helpful and some of them are, are not as helpful. It's still evolving. We can change those questions and hopefully we'll, we'll work on updating our Evaluation Kit evaluation so it's a little better because project outcome it gives us wonderful results it gives us directly usable actionable feedback for improving our instruction so we're really happy with with the results we get the open-ended questions give us really wonderful comments and, and and it just helps us know what we can do and what we should be doing and what we should try to do next
Okay, uh, excellent. So I'm going to um, sort of describe how we use project outcome directly um, with one shots. And so typically, um, um, as Scott described, one shots are typically these sort of one off um, experiences where librarians go into the classroom and we sort of give an overview um, at a professor's request. And so I'm going to talk about three different opportunities that I experienced um, in English 1010, Biology 3035, and um, Nutrition 4050, and how um, project outcome really helps me to um, structure and standardize how I present one shots for specific situations. Um, the benefits, oh, that's okay, we can leave it on this one, but the benefits of project outcome are really twofold, like Scott, like Scott mentioned. Um, because there are fewer questions, it means that we sort of get more direct feedback, um, and so we're able to sort of see um, really quickly that broad overview. Um, so the, the bar graph that has the different percentages, um, all of that really gives us kind of immediate feedback once um, all of those numbers have been um, put in and that allow, allows students not only to speak to their experience of the one shot, but it allows us to then um, really, again, tailor um, how we come into the classroom and what type of research skills we focus on. Okay. So the first example is from um, an English 1010, which is an introduction to academic writing. Um, and as um, Chris Youngkin will describe later, um, it, at SUU we have a Info 1010, which is an introduction to information literacy that is combined with an English 2010. So this course, um, this particular one shot was unique in that 1010 obviously comes before 2010. So a lot of these students hadn't had that introduction to information literacy. And so this um, particular one shot was really focused on sort of three particular objectives. It was really getting to know what librarians do and what um, can be found in the library, right? So getting to know the digital library, teaching students how to navigate this particular resource that a lot of them, this is their first introduction to that. And then also give a very, very sort of brief overview of the entire research process, um, which is why I include um, this wonderful picture that you see here of this uh, very nicely dressed gentleman whose desk is on fire. He's surrounded by books, so he's obviously got the tools for knowledge around him. Um, the dog is yapping at his feet, obviously very hungry or needing to be let out. And that's sort of what I tell students, like all of us experience that when we start and are in the middle and are at the end of the research process. And so um, this was really just sort of showing them again that they're not alone and that librarians can really help them sort of put out those fires. So the feedback um, that I received from this particular session um, was um, so 100% response rate, so 13 responses. And of those 13 respondents, 93% felt more confident about completing the assignment that they were given, which included finding different types of resources in the library and then sort of um, using that to begin and spur their ideas about brainstorming and what to do in the research process. Based on the feedback that we received a from what students wanted more information on was uh, I needed to follow up on interlibrary loan. And again, the really cool thing about getting these surveys sort of quickly meant I could then coordinate directly with the professor, sending them an email and asking them to share with their students that this was sort of the additional steps that were needed um, in order to set up an account using interlibrary loan, what it is, and I could direct them to different library web pages that detail that were able to describe in more detail the questions that they still had about this particular topic. So the next class I'm going to talk about is Biology 3035, um, Environmental Ecology Lab. And this one was unique um, for multiple reasons. Um, this was the first and only time I've ever taught this one shot. Um, and the professor had a specific assignment um, where students had to, um, from a list, choose an animal from a specific list that they were given and sort of really go into detail about their that animal's specific ecosystem. And so it was not only sort of beginning to understand the research process and how the research process fit into their assignment, but finding very particular sources using specific databases in the library. Um, we're also asked to talk about evaluating sources, tracking and citing sources, sources and synthesizing, which is a lot to cover in a 50 minute one shot. Um, and so, um, sorry, slide. 
Perfect. And so what we found with this one um, was that uh, of the 21 respondents, 91% felt more confident about completing the assignment, but still had questions about Boolean, which makes sense when you have a very specific assignment um, that required them to really sort of focus um, in more detail, um, understanding how to come up with keywords and developing search strings to really get the resources that are going to most benefit them in this assignment. Um, was something that I could then follow up on. And this particular one shot um, fortunately resulted in a in several one on one consultations where students would back pre pandemic where students got to come into my office and we got to walk through the different processes together. Um, and this sloth guy is one that um, in the feedback notes overwhelmingly people were very excited that he was included so <laughs> including him here too. <laughs> Okay, and this last one, um, again, is unique. So the first two, um, the English 1010 and Biology 3035, were one shots that I did um, sort of had different unique situations, right? So biology, I only came in once and English 1010 was sort of prior to the information literacy course. So nutrition and therapy um, and diet therapy, this course is one that I have done multiple one shots for. And so the example that I'm providing is where I taught this for the very first time. And then that way I can sort of explain how I took the project outcome surveys from this first time and then modified it and working with the professor continuing to modify how I, how I go into the classroom and teach this particular one shot. So originally the objectives were to go over how to evaluate sources using a specific method, the craft method. Um, and that includes currency, relevance, um, authority, accuracy, and purpose. And so um, specifically finding sources and then quickly evaluating them using that method, using academic databases to find sources and then trying to do a deep dive into PubMed and Zotero. So this was the first time that I taught this course and we've since modified it based on the feedback that we received. So this is the one that as you can see had the lowest um, number of students who felt more confident about completing their assignments. And part of that was because I wasn't able to really do the deep dive into PubMed and that's really what they needed. So this particular assignment requires that students focus on a specific disease and how nutrition sort of plays a role in helping or hindering the controlling of this disease. Um, uh, because it was the first time that I had taught this, um, I wasn't as familiar with PubMed and mess um, and uh, medical subject headings and how those explode. Um, and it's actually super, super fascinating. So as I've sort of taught this more and more, um, I was able to learn along with the students how to really successfully complete searches in these different databases using this very sort of specific um, tips and tricks that are required for something like PubMed and medical subject headings. So that was something that I had to learn along with the students. Um, since then, we've been able to um, really sort of focus. So I've tailored the assignment, so or my presentation, so that it really focuses on um, examples that students have done in the past, right? So focusing on, um, so like asthma, for example, or diabetes. So those are things that students have worked with in the past. And so using those as examples, when I, um, when I do the one shot. I've also worked with Professor Clark who teaches this class so that we've sort of really customized this particular research assignment so that way students are finding different types of resources. So popular sources and scholarly sources um, that sort of talk of, and how those sources communicate with each other. Um, and one of the examples that we do like to talk about is the Popeye spinach myth, which is again, why Popeye is included in this one shot image. Think that's it. All right, thanks, Scott and Rosie. Um, so, um, so Scott gave you a good overview of what Project Outcome is, and Rosie talks about how we use it as librarians. And with with the one shots, that's really kind of using this um, in a context where there may not be as much follow up, um, and that it's kind of more dependent on what that class needs. But then you're going to go in and you're going to leave that class. But um, I was curious to see if project outcome could be useful in my class. And um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about how I used it. Um, for people in the audience who are non-librarians, you could might think of this as how you might use a survey as a learning tool in an activity, uh, even if um, maybe this specific survey of project, project outcome might not really fit into what you teach. But, um, but when I was um, at a previous institution, uh, I used a short uh, three or four question survey um, when I would go in and I would give presentations for first year students about the library. And um, 
it was kind of a mix of different types of activities and a little bit of lecture like presentation. So what I did is I broke my, uh, my presentation up into three different parts. And then at the end of each of those sort of little segments, I would have the students answer a question on the survey. So I was both um, kind of collecting some data for myself, but then also giving them a chance to reflect. So that's something that I learned was a pretty good model. Um, so here at SUU, as, as Rosie said, we teach um, a class called Info 1010, which is co-required with a writing class. And um, in the past, uh, so typically um, the, the librarians or the, the, uh, the instructors teaching that course will go into the English class up to four times in a semester and, and deliver um, sort of lessons on the, the content for Info 1010. And um, so I wanted to try something a little bit different. And so I wanted to make active learning uh, sort of activities rather than just lecturing during those, during those sessions. Um, so, you know, Info 1010 is, um, it's still uh, information literacy related. So I knew that um, based on my experience using project outcome in one shots that I would be able to, um, like that the questions would kind of align with what I was doing. Um, and the standard questions, I knew they would probably work. I didn't know if all of them would, would exactly match up with what I was teaching, but, and I'll get into a little bit of that in a minute. But I also knew that I could make custom questions. And so I would be able to use these custom questions to, um, to make some questions that would fit into an activity. And then it would also include the standard questions. So my plan was to um, do these 45 minute learning activities. And um, these were gonna be three consecutive sessions in three different sections with one survey per section. Um, I wanted to do the activity in each of the sections I was teaching, but I didn't want them to get survey fatigue and do kind of the same thing. So um, what I ended up with was some, some results from um, an activity about database searching, one about information evaluation and one about information synthesis. So when it came to the standard questions and seeing if they would fit, um, and Scott already told you what these questions are, so I'll just kind of briefly go over these. Um, the first th three are, they were kind of generic enough that, um, that, they would, that they would work. If I'm looking at question number two here, um, feeling more confident in completing my assignments, um, I assumed that students would be thinking of that in the context of the assignment that they were working on for my class that week, or maybe for the paper they were working on. Um, and then do they intend to apply what they learned? So, so those questions, and then uh, the first of the standard open-ended questions, those were generic enough that I didn't really think it would, it would matter. But the ones, um, number four and number six, which were specifically about the library, um, I wasn't as sure, because if I was going in and doing a one shot, I would be talking about specific library resources. But in these sessions, I was talking more about the skills that they would need in the research process. So I didn't know um, how, how, these would, how these would go. And then um, number six, especially, uh, what else could the library do to help you succeed in your classes? I, I didn't know if the students would really make the connection between what I was teaching for my class and the library as kind of an institution. And then in the custom questions, um, the approach I took on in the first session was to just have one question that would, would kind of come at, at the end of the activity to kind of give them a chance to reflect and kind of summarize what they learned. Um, and then the other two questions were for different purposes. And so in the activity, I also used um, a Google form and there were some other, some group work and stuff that we did. This was all on Zoom, um, but I had them open this, um, open the survey, and then kind of set it aside. And then once we were kind of wrapping wrapping it up, I asked them to go ahead and answer the question, which was about these three different kinds of searches we did. And then, um, you know, the please share uh, one thing you learned today. And then, what questions do you still have? Like Scott said, these are kind of those typical kind of uh, closing questions and the sort of the exit ticket questions. And so when, when I was initially creating this survey, um, I kind of imagined that there would be um, some kind of follow-up 
Um, but the, the thing that I realized kind of too late was that this is an anonymous survey. So even though I had all the data and all the answers to these questions, I didn't know who had asked these questions. Um, I could have followed up kind of more generally in the next session, but um, yeah, I didn't think about that at the time. So uh, getting the results for these surveys, um, I noticed that with the four Likert questions, there was a significant difference in the results from these sessions and the results from the, the other sessions that I had. So for example, um, in some of these, the um, it was the numbers, the percentages that were, were shown were pretty low. And so whereas, so typically, um, you know, the question about if they feel confident completing assignments, um, kind of, I don't know if it's ironic or not, but like that was actually 62% in one of those sessions. And so um, only 62% of the students felt confident completing the assignment after I had literally just gone through and, and had them practice the skills and then explained the assignment that they were gonna be doing. So it, it kind of caught me a little off guard. Um, and so typically the numbers, those percentages for those kind of four different areas are much higher in the one shot. And so I don't really know how to account for that. But when it came to the standard open-ended questions, I was able to get some um, some good feedback for myself. You know, that asking, you know, what do you, what did you like about the session? That kind of can can help me when I'm doing this again in the future. And then, what else can the library do? That was kind of a mixed result. And then on those um, those custom questions, all, all of that kind of gave me an insight into what the students were learning, and then also kind of what what they um, were taking away from it. And so um, in the future, I, I plan on doing this again. And in the future, what I'll do is, is actually use those custom questions and then gather that data, review that, and then follow up in the next class, kind of to the whole class. All right, so um, the benefits, um, I, the benefits of, and, and this would apply to, to you integrating a survey into any learning activity, um, is that you get to collect some data. And um, kind of going back to, to what I did at my previous institution, um, that data really helped me to understand how first year students were thinking about the library. And so I was able to use that data to kind of, um, uh, to influence how I designed other programming that I did. Um, in the context of Info 1010, having that data can really help me to, to see um, what the students are receiving, what's missing, what, are the, what needs to be, um, you know, kind of more detailed in the next round of this. And also it's a way to check learning. So it, it gives the students a chance to articulate uh, what they've just learned. And so I think that's always valuable. And then um, with the follow-up, um, and I fully intend in the future to, to use that, uh, use what I get much more extensively as I'm sort of reviewing at the beginning of the next session, because these are generally sequential from week to week. And so um, I definitely think that, that this is gonna be a, a useful tool for me going forward. And finally, some of the limitations, like I said before, some of the questions might not fit super neatly. And, and if you're gonna use an existing survey um, and kind of repurpose it in this, in this way, um, kind of take that into consideration. It's also a little clumsy because I'm, because on the, you know, if the student has a survey open on their computer and then, and then I'm saying, okay, answer number seven. And then we go on and do a little bit more. And then I'm like, okay, now go back and answer the rest of the questions. Like it's a little funky. And then um, it also takes time. And so, especially as someone um, going into the classroom, kind of as a guest, I have a limited amount of time that I have to work with. Um, and then even if it was my own classroom and I had the full session, there would probably be other things that I'd want to incorporate in. So um, kind of taking that into account and um, kind of planning that in, I think is really, really helpful. So that's all I have. So to wrap up, we, we really like Project Outcome and it gives us wonderful numbers. And we do see some great future uses and, and possible uses for Project Outcome. It can certainly be used programmatically to look at our library instruction overall and in general to see what topics uh, we're teaching to also um, get a good idea of what students are learning or having a difficult time learning and understanding. 
Um, we can use it to supplement our, our current student evaluation of teaching. Like I said, it, the one we have now is a little bit of a mixed bag, doesn't give us a lot of really great actionable information. So it's something we can uh, supplement that uh, official uh, student evaluation with. And of course, we will definitely continue to use it with one shot instructions. However, I think the biggest, most important use for us right now is uh, using um, project outcome with our, our promotion and tenure process. It gives us, like I said, some really wonderful numbers and wonderful feedback. And our, our new process requires us to reflect on what we did and, and having this information on, on how well your teaching went and what your student learn, learn what your students learned uh, gives us a really great opportunity to reflect on how that process went. Uh, another part of our new PNT um, process is that we have to write a plan at the beginning of the year for what we want to do. So we get this feedback and we, we can see how we did and now we can make a plan for what we're going to do to improve and write that up in, into our PNT document. This is what I'm going to try to improve my teaching, to see if I can improve my student understanding of these, of these concepts. And then to sort of complete that whole cycle, you can resurvey and, 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 and get that full picture. This is what I tried. This is what I learned. This is what I'm going to do to make the whole process better. And, and this is the outcome. Look at, look at what I achieved. I've, I've improved my teaching. I've improved my student learning. So we're really excited to have this, this tool as a part of our PNT process because I think it's really going to, to add wonderful information and, and fits really nicely with our new PNT. Um, policy as well with this whole idea of planning and reporting and reflecting on what what we've done and where we can improve. So now, if you have any questions, please let us know. There is a question in the chat. I'm not sure if I got answered. Uh, Elizabeth Cox is wondering for formative assessment purposes, how does what can be gathered through a Google form compare to what can be gathered from project outcome surveys? Uh, project outcome is very structured. And, and if those questions aren't going to work for you, um, then I would definitely go with a Google form. Um, they both actually do a really nice job of gathering the information and giving you summaries of the information. Project outcome is really designed to do that. So you get those wonderful little bar graphs and, and averages and scores and all that wonderful stuff without uh, much input or intervention on your part. So it, it's really, really nice that way. And then uh, it does also just basically give you the whole list of all of your student comments as well. So you can have those comments to go through later. And, and I'll add that the questions that are on there are questions that have been tested and there's a specific reason why those particular questions are the standard questions. And so um, rather if I was making my own assessment and just kind of coming up with my own questions, you know, I wouldn't have the knowledge to really, um, to really know what would be the most effective questions. So any questions from um, uh, other librarians who might be in the room or are there other library folks in the room? Yeah, I had a question and sorry, my, um, I kept having to run out to help, help my son, but, um, and maybe, so maybe you talked about this at, near the end, but um, for move, moving forward, um, are, there, are there any, uh, sort of big changes that you look forward to or, or things that you look want to explore in terms of different approaches or? Um, I'd say that we, one of the things that we want to do is get more of our librarians using this. Um, so right now um, it's optional if, if librarians are going in and doing one shots. Um, we'd like to get everyone to do at least one, uh, one every year so we can get kind of a, a broader overview uh, programmatically. Um, I plan to keep using them in my teaching. I don't know if any of the other librarians will get on board with that, but I, I'd love to um, 
kind of make a little project out of that and see if um, if we could use this to get some some teaching in our in our classroom teaching in addition to our one shots. Yeah, and I'll, I'll second that. I, our, our current evaluation, like I said, of a student evaluation of teaching is OK. It's not great. I just don't think it's nearly as good as this. And you can see that if you just think about this on a whole class level, the questions still work um, and, and, and you get really good feedback. So I, I, I plan to use this as a supplement to our current um, university promotion and tenure because I think it'll give me better feedback for improving my classes. Well, thank you so much, Chris, Scott, and Rosie. That was a great presentation. Um, and we can get ready to go on to uh, the ones we have on our schedules next. Thank you so much.